Hello, everybody. Welcome at Cisco Live. So we are live here. I'm together with Marcel, and I quickly want to introduce myself. I'm Markus Habeck. I'm a senior solution architect in customer services. And uh, I will guide you today, and of course, Marcel, through an SDA environment, how to get it from zero to 100, and make sure you understand all the components and SDA until it's up and running. Let me give Marcel a chance to introduce himself quickly. Okay. Thank you, Marcus, uh, and hello, everybody. My name is Marcel Rothstein. I'm a technical solution architect based in Frankfurt, Germany, and today I'm here to help Marcus a little bit uh, with the introduction of SDA. So, Marcus, how can we start? So, let's do a quick introduction. The first of us, for the two of us, we are both German. So, for anybody watching this, uh, this presentation, uh, the accent might be very bad, so you can ping us later on if you have a good idea how we can improve this. So let me dig into um, the, my, uh, the presentation. It is about software-defined access. You have heard that this is a new solution offered from Cisco mm -hmm. and has been developed over the last couple of years. So software-defined access had been built on top of our switching portfolio and we introduced new capabilities into iOS. In the beginning, everybody on Earth was doing this using command line interface. So you remember the days where we all were at the keyboard and trying to figure out how to get a VLAN configured, how to get a default gateway configured, how to make high availability enabled. And you know all the hustle together with spanning tree and the large broadcast domains and failure domains and uh, to troubleshoot those environments. So the idea of software defined access is to put a controller on top of the environment. That means we completely abstract the way we do the network. So the abstraction means you buy a piece of hardware. It can be a Catalyst 9000, it can be a 3850, it can be anything. So you buy a piece of hardware. On top of the hardware, you usually have an installed iOS version. And this can be a big variety of different iOS versions, right? So all the iOS versions behave differently. And the third level on top of hardware and software is about the license. Mm -hmm. So the network behaves very differently if you buy an essential license or if you buy an advantage license. So what we have done in the past, we left our engineers and of course our customer and partners a little bit alone with how to configure the environment, how to make SDXs possible, how to make switching possible. And if you update the environment, you may have recognized already that commands may change. So what we have done here is we have created a controller named DNA Center. DNA Center is not now in the version of 1.3.3.0. We recently announced this uh, release. It is a week old, by the way. And DNA Center is taking care of this abstraction. We call this intent-based networking. So the intent is about what I want to do. It's not about how I configure my network. It's not about which different commands you need to use. It's about, I want to get a fabric up and running. I want to connect an end user, and the end user should be capable of connecting to the data center or to his or her application. So DNA Center brings all of it. Does it make sense for you? Yeah. For me, it sounds really great. The only question I have, because I can see that you've put ICE uh, in your slide as well, so your SDA solution is not just about automation, isn't it? That is correct. So that's a very good question, Marcel. So DNA Center brings automation into it. We call this intent to automate the network infrastructure. It gives you context with this, uh, with this assurance and analytics because you need to troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. and Regular networks were just built for connectivity, for forwarding, so connecting the device, and you can ping your application, you can open email and do things like this. But as of today, security becomes more and more relevant for network environments. So the idea is to utilize Identity Services Engine, embed them into DNA Center, so we have a channel between ICE and DNA Center, and use all the beauty of Identity Service Engine for policy, for security, for user identification, for authentication, radius and tuckers into the switches. And we didn't build a new environment for this. We just took Identity Services Engine, which is out for a while, and integrate this into DNA Center. So having said this in the beginning, I mentioned you, we left you alone with CLI, and now we have DNA Center to automate it. That means on the other hand side, now you have ICE, and you need to provision ICE your own. And we did exactly the same thing. So we go and abstract ICE from the network, and DNA Center will take care about ICE configuration. So whenever you create a policy, DNA Center is your single pane of glass. You configure your policy like you do, you set up your fabric, and DNA Center pushes this into Identity Service Engine, and you don't have to touch it. 
So great, so I'm just using DNA Center to set up my network to create my policies and later on to troubleshoot it? Yes, you got it. That's exactly what it's meant to be. Sounds really cool. So what else do I need to do in my network to get such a solution? Yeah, let's dig in. So there are components. We, we talked about DNA Center, automation, analytics and assurance. The identity service, services engine as a component for policy. By the way, it's a requirement. You need to install ICE to make SDA happen. And let's dig into the different things and components out of SDXs which are important. So the first you need to know is that we distinguish SDX is into three components. It's the control plane, which is built on locator ID separation protocol. So that's your route reflector. That's where we are learning all the routes from the endpoints. That's where we are learning all the routes from the data center and the external networks. Since we go to a fabric environment, we decided not to do layer two uh, um, connectivity anymore. So you don't have to build all the VLANs, all the trunks or spanning tree. Um, multi shots either channel, things like that. Uh, but therefore we needed to introduce a new encapsulation so that we can get the traffic from the client from the endpoint to the network and this is VXLAN. Okay. And VXLAN can distinguish between a micro segment and a macro segment. A macro segment is a, virf, a virtual network and we are going to deploy one of these networks in a minute. And a micro segment is about separating the two of us in a single network. So we can make happen in a policy environment that you can me, but can ping me, but you cannot connect via file transfer on any other protocol. And this is all automated under the covers. It's just the components because we want to inform you what's going on because it will be very easy to set it up and we will see this in a minute. But of course, if something goes wrong, it may be good to have some ideas what's under the covers. Okay, but at the end of the day, I have to know about these protocols, but I don't have to configure them because this is something DNA Center can do for me? That is perfectly correct. So you need to know it because, of course, you want to troubleshoot this, but all the commands will come out of DNA Center. It will be fully automated. And we just want to make you comfortable that you understand the environment and can create the confidence that we do not do anything which is very crazy and would not work. And we go into the console and I will show you a couple of things happening in the fabric. Looking forward. So what are the fabric roles and terminologies? We already talked about DNA Center automation. DNA Center automation is taking care about what kind of devices in the network, software version and license, and will push the configuration to the switch, to the router, or to the wireless controller. So wireless is part of it. As soon as you have discovered or introduced a device into DNA Center, it will start collecting analytics data and will give you a view is it in a good health status or is it in a bad position and we give you guided remediation. Today we will focus on the SDA portion of DNA Center. So assurance comes along, it is included in the licensing and it will run automatically. You don't have to do anything in addition. Identity Services Engine, as we have discussed, runs in the background to create policies and make security available. And of course, under the covers, there are a couple of components. We have a so-called control plane node and the control plane node is responsible about learning the endpoint devices. So let's do an example. You connect to your network, and uh, the network switch will learn your IP address and your MAC address. Mm -hmm. And we will announce this address, like we do it in DNS, towards the control plane, and the control plane exactly knows where Marcel sits in the network. Actually, to be honest, it doesn't know that's you, Marcel, but it knows your IP address. So the second piece is the fabric border node. So inside the fabric, we do VXLAN encapsulation, but you may want to talk to foreign devices, devices on the internet, in the data center, in your traditional environment, once you have not migrated everything, and the border node is taking care that we translate software defined access VXLAN encapsulation into the traditional way of forwarding IP packets. The third component is the fabric edge, and this is the most obvious one, it is your access layer switch. So the access layer switch is the one you connect to, it will learn your IP address. It will, as mentioned, register your IP address to the control plane. And by the end, it makes sure that you are reachable for all the other devices and takes care of the encapsulation into the fabric and the decapsulation because most likely your endpoint doesn't understand VXLAN. Absolutely. Yes. And if I look on your slide, it just looks for me like a traditional three-tier network design with core distribution access. Mm -hmm. um, but I see some grayed out uh, switches in the middle. So what does it mean for me? Can I use my traditional network physical topology or do I have to recable everything? Yeah, perfect. So the grayed out devices are called intermediate nodes in SDXs. 
That means if you have a very large network, you may have a border, which is your connection to the data center, but then you need to distribute everything into the buildings. So you don't want to run cables from every single access switch to your major locations. And therefore, you most likely run distribution switches per building or in several areas. And the intermediate node is acting and behaving as a distribution node. It will be a fully routed environment. It will interconnect to the edge nodes, but it doesn't participate in VXLAN and any of the control plane instances. So it's just the scaling the environment. You can do a core distribution access design as you know it from the past, but it's even more capable. I will show you LAN automation during the presentation, and we are very topology independent. So you can build ring topologies, you can do triangles, you can do daisy chaining, so there are almost no limitations. Of course, for scalability, we may hit one, but we release a couple of the topology dependencies we had in the past. Oh, wow, that sounds great. And uh, as you already mentioned, some kind of automation with the LAN, so does it mean I can fully configure everything from DNA Center without using any CLI? Yes, that is correct. So DNA Center is taking care of full, LC, uh, full CLI configuration. The only thing if you have very special features, let's do an example, storm control. You want to make sure if I have a broadcast that I control it into the switch. I mean, the impact is only the edge node itself, but those commands are not being pushed by DNA Center because we don't consider them. And therefore, we have a template programmer, and you can push all the commands you need in this environment after SDA provisioning has happened. Oh, wow. So it really looks nice on the PowerPoint, but uh, how is the reality? Yeah, so I will show you the demo in a second. Let's go to the last component, oh, the fabric wireless controller. Missing. Yes, oh. exactly. We have this wireless controller, and we do embed wireless into SDXs and convert the access point into a VXLAN speaker so that they participate the same way an edge node in SDXs does and is part of the fabric and is embedded and has the same policy environment, the same IP pool environment in SDXs. So even we take care about all your wireless devices. So and even the uh, WSC is managed by the DNA center? That is correct. You, you read in the uh, wireless controller, you add it to the fabric, and you are done. That's all you need to do. No more SSIDs, fabric, AP groups, nothing no, This is all gone. You need to create your SSID, to be honest, because you need to tell the controller what to provision. But all the rest of it is gone, so there's no complex configuration in terms of the access point at, uh, wow. at all. So let's go into the live controller. This is DNA Center. It's an up-to-date version. They offered me a new update on the top right corner for those who have recognized that we have the little cloud with the 13 updates. Nevertheless, we have DNA Center. When you start with DNA Center, you need to give some information into the system because mm -hmm. it doesn't know who you are, who your organization are, what your IP address scheme is. So this is something we do under the design aspect. I al already um, prepared an environment for you, and we will run the demo in Berlin in Germany. So you see I have a design structure for a couple of locations. I have uh, prepared Berlin, it's, uh, it's the country itself, and I have prepared a building. So the DNA Center knows where it is, and you can of course upload a floor plan and position your access point in this and get proper heat maps, et cetera, later on. Mm -hmm. The next thing on the, under design you need to do is to explain DNA Center, what are my network settings? What is my DNS server? What is my DHCP server? What is my radio server? What is my banner method of today? What are my images I want to use? So all the site expects we cannot know. Because DNA Center, once we provision the network, will form the entire configuration out of these parameters. Okay. So the next thing, which is fairly important, is about IP address pools. Mm -hmm. So SDA has a different way of doing IP addressing. So in the former life, you may remember that we had a VLAN and an IP subnet tied together. And normally it was the case that we tried to have small subnets to keep failure in broadcast domains very small and make the impact if something goes wrong not distributed into the entire network. Maybe we can cap it in an access layer only. So what we have done here is we said, okay, we do register slash 32 addresses, so your endpoint ID, your endpoint IP, and uh, therefore you can have a very huge subnet configured for a fabric site, and I will go to show you what a fabric site is in a minute. So you only have one IP subnet for your virtual network if you want. There are some use cases of having more of them, but it's as simple as it is. And I've prepared one of this, which is um, for my demo here. So I've prepared an IP pool and an IP range in the DHCP server already. So that's everything you have to do, nothing that is, else? That is correct from the design perspective. 
Wow. So we get to the next stage and provision the fabric itself. And then I will show you that the IP configuration on the switch will completely automatically retrieve out of, the, out of this. Oh, that's interesting. But one more question, uh, because I saw that you can add new IP address pools, and we all know that some customers already having some kind of uh, IP address management systems which uh, are already used for um, yeah, setting up their IP ranges. So is there any way to get these uh, information already into DNA Center? Yeah, so that's a very common ask. So thanks for asking this question. So what we have done, this is, looks like an IP address management tool. What we have done, we built an integration on the top you see platform, and the platform piece in DNA Center connects to um, third-party systems, which can be your Microsoft DHCP server, or can be Infoblox or BlueCat, just to name some of the examples. It's completely independent what kind of DHCP vendor you have. And we are able to learn from the DHCP vendor what subnets are already assigned. So we fill up this table automatically. Or if you, try, if you want to provision the pools from DNA Center, DNA Center will make them available, for example, in Infoblox, and also activate the DHCP ranges. So you don't have to touch the IP address management tool anymore. That's great. And maybe also there's a, a one more thing. If you want to edit and say, I need to do get IPv6, it's just a matter of the point in time you want to run IPv6 in the overlay, you just enable IPv6, get an IPv6 pool into it, press save, and it will be auto-deployed into your network end-to-end. -end. Wow. So once we have done the design, let's go to provision. I've already set up the switches in terms of time. Right, you can bring up everything using LAN automation. Let me quickly go into this. There's a process called LAN automation. You can select a primary site, which is called um, Berlin, uh, for example. So it will give you um, the, um, the, the, the possibility to add devices out of Berlin, which we call a C device. Mm -hmm. You can then select an IP pool for the specific device and you can provision everything without touching a single time this command line interface. That means even the seat unit, which is the border in the future in many cases, will connect home to DNA Center via plug and play protocol. DNA Center will take care of the configuration, will push the IP pools, and will take care of the next layer, the intermediate node you ask for, the, the grayed out ones, yes. and the edge node, and will bring up all the devices from scratch and you don't have to touch the CLI a single time. So. Does it even mean that I do not have to use any templates because I know many customers use them in the past using Prime Infrastructure, APKM, uh, setting up a template, pushing it, using plug and play. So this is different plug and play? That is 100% correct. So what we have done is we took all the beauty and the features and functions out of plug and play. And SDA means it's intent. So we pre-created all the templates for you. They are in the back end. And once you do LAN automation, it knows this switch is an SDA device. So we create the template for you and will be pushed automatically in the background. You don't have to create CLI, it's all done by us. Wow. That's really cool. So I've done this for you. So these switches are up and running. Let's go into the fabric environment. So let's do the cool stuff right now. You see I already have prepared a so-called fabric domain. A fabric domain means this is owned by an administrator. Today it's me. Um, if I dig into this one, I do see already a couple of fabrics up and running. So a fabric site is something like I have a, um, a set of switches in Frankfurt in my case. I have a set of uh, switches in Düsseldorf, et cetera, et cetera. But we were talking about Berlin. So in Berlin is nothing. Let's assume it's a new location. Mm -hmm. So the thing I need to do um, is to create and add a new fabric site. And you don't have to do it um, on your purpose. What you can do is just select Berlin because it's already been pre-provisioned by DNA Center in the design phase, and it will automatically create you the fabric site. The only thing you need to answer is, which virtual networks do you want to have in Berlin? So which users need to connect? In my case, it's just a demo one VN. Let's assume these are employees. So let's enable this, and DNA Center will do a provisioning in the background, and will set up this fabric site for you, and uh, automatically assign if I click into the fabric, all the devices which have been pre-assigned to the site using the LAN automation process. Oh, wow. So whatever came up by LAN automation is already part of the site. Let's zoom in a little bit. You see I have a couple of um, 3850s, 9Ks, etc. So what we need to do now is to identify the border node and the control plane. This is mandatory. There's no SDA without a border and control plane. So what I do is my border uh, device, I just select it, 
I need to give the information for BGP, which is my, uh, my autonomous system number, and I've pre-decided it's 65125. It may be different in your environment. And then I explain, I do have a transit exit. That means I explain the border, how to connect to the outside world. So to my traditional network, to my data center, correct. everything which is Every outside the new fabric. That is correct. Okay. So that means we use this transit network and the transit link to learn external IP addresses. So let's add this. Um, that's pretty much it. The second thing we need to do is to enable the control plane, as mentioned. It's a mandatory that we do have a control plane. So can it run on the same device? Yes, that is correct. You can run a control plane and a border node co-located on the device. But if you want for high availability reasons or for scalability reasons, you can separate border node and control plane. So that's really cool. That means if you are a small environment, you can co-locate it on the same box. If you want to grow, you can split them up again. That is correct. And also you can put the control plane into different locations to make sure, okay, I have some kind of physical high availability. Okay. The next thing you need to do in this case is to enable the edge node function for the access switch. That's and this all. is only the one you do. I do it the five ones individually, but I show you a better way how you can do it in a second. Because um, if you run like hundreds of switches, you most likely don't want to do the way I do here. And all you do in the background while we are talking is to apply the configuration in the network. So edge node is just a single click. No information at all because we already defined the border. We have already defined the access point and the control plane, and we have the predefined IP pools. So what we now add to the fabric is all the IP configuration for the underlay, so that all the edge nodes and borders can reach each other. That's amazing, because you, you just swiped a, a button, and is there really configuration changes on the switches? Yes, there are really configuration changes on the switches. Let's quickly step in. In the background, you see something is going on on the switch. I have a config archive logger in. So you see we are really pushing things like a map resolver into the switch, and the map resolver is a list role for the control plane. So there's really live happening something on the switch, and this is not a mock-up, this is a live network environment. And the beauty of it, you can step into the switch and you can read all the configuration we have been pushed for your convenience, because if you start with software-defined access, you most likely want to create some trust and, okay, Cisco, what are you doing there? So you can learn all the commands if you want. But it's a lot of work, because it's a couple of hundred commands being published in the background. But given this way, I'm much faster in rolling out my new network, aren't exactly. I? Exactly. Imagine you have uh, like hundreds of those switches. Um, they call, all come in by plug and play, and all of them will be completely automatically distributed. And you don't have to prepare anything. The only pro process you have to start is LAN automation. So you can do it building by building, and it can be done by an operator who most likely has no deep knowledge of VXLAN and LISP. But it can also be done, of course, by the knowledge people in the beginning, and it helps really reducing rollout times. So, and you're hiding the complexity from the administrator or the user just to make their life a little bit easier as well? Absolutely, that's the, in, that's the idea of intent. So we want to make sure, okay, we give you all the insights to create trust, but once you have uh, understand this and tested it, we just want to make sure it's a single knob in environment to get up in edge node. Imagine you built a building, 50 switches, and a year later you get an extra space and you need additional switches. It's a matter of mounting the switch, cabling the switch, power it up, press these three buttons and you're good to go. Okay, so now I have the switches up and running, but uh, what happens if I want to try to connect with a client? Yeah, that's what we do next. So one is for everybody in the, in the room, it's about I can also select multiple devices and assign an edge role, right? I can go into edit. They are all in the fabric. It will complain because they are already distributed. But you see, I get this edge node button, so I can do this for hundreds of devices simultaneously and don't have to run through every single device. Oh. You may have recognized the host onboarding button here. Yeah. So this is now the magic piece, which is the next step. Oh. This, this has some preparation to, do, to be done. SDX is, we had a former name called Secure Access. It's about security. So you need to decide what kind of authentication you want to do. If you're coming from a traditional network, most likely you don't have authentication. So your clients running, uh, don't running 802.1x supplicants or stuff like this. So you can go no authentication. Or you say, no, I want to do a closed authentication environment. So the endpoint needs to authenticate and authorize using the network. So we send credentials. Um, and do a challenge and response. We send an AVPA all the way up to Identity Services Engine, 
they will, ICE will make sure our oh, Marcel is existing and push back the policy with the proper VLAN and IP addressing for you and opens up the port so that the endpoint gets the correct IP address. So it means if you just uh, select close authentication and uh, set as default, all my wired network is now up and ready for 1.1x? Correct. In the same moment, it's completely up and running for 8.2.1x. Imagine how many commands 8.2.1x were on the switch in the past. Yeah, I was just thinking about how many lines of configuration that was needed in the older times to configure 1.1x on my switch ports. It was a lot of pain, so this looks really easy for me. Yeah, and the fun was if you have different platforms and different iOS versions, it was a lot of fun. If you are a network engineer, you know what we are talking about. But by the end of the day, you don't want to deal with this anymore. And it's also taking care about software updates. So if I get a new version, it will push the proper configuration to the device. Oh, wow. So the next thing we need to do is the virtual network itself. We already selected the demo VN, which is being provisioned in the network. You may have recognized there is an infrastructure VN. So the infrastructure VN has um, the job of connecting access points and extended nodes, so smaller switches which can be uh, connected to an edge node. And access points need to operate in the underlay network to reach the wireless controller and do all the roaming management. And therefore, we have built a VN, which is not a VN. So finally, it's a show IP route, no worth configuration, but the name of it is Infra VN. So we don't have to touch this because we do the wire demo for now. Um, the only thing I have to do now is, OK, I need to add an IP pool. So we have created this IP pool um, before. Uh, there's no IP pool, that is interesting. So this is about live demos, right? Let me click, um, get into it. So in general, we have to add the IP pool, which is not presenting here. So the demo fails. This is all about live demos, right? Normally, we get the IP pool into the controller. Um, we have the authentication profile. Uh, something is really going wrong here. Um, I'm sorry about this. Um, this is normally always happening. So we can add the IP pool here. Let me go through one more time and see if it's after reload, if it's going. Um, so adding the IP pool to the virtual network. So back to VN, back to host onboarding, back to virtual network, back to demo, um, add an IP pool, and we still don't see it. So let's leave it like here. Um, so we're adding the IP pool to the network. Um, give it the nomination, um, the, the job of being a data pool or a voice pool which ends up in the decision, do we provide it as a, as a trunk port for a phone, or if you provide it just as an access port in that case, and decide if this is, um, has a scalable group for further policy test in that case. So once we have done this, we can add this, and so in this case, it's not showing up. Let me fall back. I have a plan B for you, and I really apologize that this happens to the controller. So let's go in my demo VN in my other fabric site. You see that I have added IP pools in here, and uh, this end up in provisioning the IP information into the switch. We are configuring interface VLAN um, with a number, and the number is up to us, so you don't have to distinguish between numbers or prepare anything in here. And we'll be pushed to the switch and make the switch IP reachable. And as soon as it now, because we had 802.1x enabled, if you log into the switch using 802.1x, you will be assigned the proper VLAN, and you immediately get a DHCP answer and can work. Oh, wow. So again, there was no CLI until now, right? There's no CLI until now. Wow. So once I've done this, I can go further down. And now I have, um, I do see the list of my switches. In my case, now the Frankfurt domain, because Berlin has some issues. We need to troubleshoot this later on. Um, there will be an assurance message, message, most likely, what's going on. So I get a full overview about my switches. And in this fabric, I have a couple of switches. Um, cut nine case with different number scheme, and they are all enabled by LAN automation. And I get a full overview about my network environment, my connected ports. You see I've already configured some. Let's sort them with a link up status. So you can detect, OK, there are a couple of devices connected already. And uh, those devices are different. I have one port which has no configuration in it. So it looks like empty. Mm -hmm. But my default authentication is 802.1x. In this port, I already have pre-assigned this port statically um, to a given thing. So let's do it for this specific port. Let's assign it, because there are three different ways of assigning a port. We have a so-called user or endpoint policy or profile, means your PC, your Mac, whatever end device you have, it's just an access port. We have an access point, therefore we need the infra VN, and we do have a server port if you want to connect a server to the network. 
And the server most likely runs in separate VLANs to serve different uh, customers or different applications to your endpoints. And it will provision a trunk to the interface so that you can be part of different virtual networks if you want. Once you have selected it, you can select the IP pool for this environment, because we do not do 802.1x. 1x will return a VLAN ID for you, mm -hmm. so we'll be auto-assigned to the correct VLAN. If you do a static authentication, we don't have this information. So you need to do this manually. You can assign a, a group for, for policy, which I'm not doing here right now, and you can say, um, no, it's a no authentication. So I do an exception to my default policy. So the port is a static, standard, traditional layer two access port as you know it from the past. Okay, so just in case I have an old printer which is not capable of running .1x, this would be the solution to get the printer in that the fabric a, up and running. That is a perfect example. I can put a description on top of it so that if you want to do this, I mean, you know, okay, I have this printer connected to my network. I can put in a special description and DNS Center will put the description into the port configuration for you. So when I update this, I need to um, apply the configuration. You may have recognized I can do it now. I can schedule it. And schedule means I can also send this change all the way up to an IT service management tool like ServiceNow, Remedy, or whatever you have in mind. And this will create a change in this change management and somebody needs to approve the change. If the change has not been approved, then the change will not be fulfilled from the system. So not, nobody configures the network. Either DNS Center doesn't push anything, and if you approve the change and the time window matches, then DNS Center will fulfill the change at the given time. Okay, so I assume the integration in any IT service management is exactly the same like the integration with ICE or the IPAM services? That is correct. So we do, did exactly the same. So we put in IPAM, we put in IT service management, and it's as open as this. So we integrate, if you um, go through the controller, you will see ServiceNow but it's totally open to integrate other IT service management vendors. So we want to be independent in that case, and therefore we opened up the platform, and um, there may be some work on the other vendor side to do because they need to call our APIs, but this is all documented, and there are also software development kits available. Okay. So, now given the fact that uh, the fabric is up and running, how do I, troubleshoot, how do I see? Because I can remember at the beginning you mentioned something with assurance, so what's this kind of feature in DNA Center? Yeah, that's a, that's a good ask. You have seen that um, we have now brought the fabric up and running. The ports are connected either authentic dynamically or you do, the, do a static port assignment. We saw a bit of wireless, we embedded the wireless controller. We did not the demo, but it's as simple as this. So you just add the wireless SSID, assign an IP address scheme, and it will push it out to the network. So the next thing is, once you're up and running, of course, you get, go into the life cycle of the network. And therefore, the DNA Center comes along with network assurance. So in the beginning, I told you, when we enable the devices and put it into the inventory of the DNA Center, the DNA Center automatically starts collecting the environment. So we get analytics data from the switches into DNA Center, and DNA Center will do a math and calculate the analytics data, are they in good shape or are they in bad shape? And as you can see, I at least have a wireless controller, finally, which is one of the unsupported controllers in my network, which is not green, but my core distribution and access environment is fine. You see I have about a 97% um, health of my wired environment, so I have 35 connected devices to the fabric, and it may have happened that in Berlin, some of the 1X clients already showed up, and connected to the network and are already um, into operation and pinging through the network and doing the application stuff. Okay, so uh, when I remember correctly at the beginning, there was uh, ICE uh, mentioned on your slides as well. So ICE is already known for the policies. So how is the policy integration with ICE working with DNA Center? Is there something special? Because you mentioned I do not have to go to ICE. That is correct. So what we have done, if you go to settings, I give you a quick overview. Um, where you can see ICE in the system. So we haven't touched it, um, but on the, in, the, in the system 360, we have a connection to ICE. It's based on PX grid, so you just have to give DNA Center an IP address of ICE and the credentials and press on apply and will we'll form a trust connection between the two. They will exchange certificates and form a secure channel. So that's all you have to do. They turn green. And from now on, ICE can act as a RADIUS and TACAC server for network and user authentication, but it will also be the policy engine. So we talked about security in the network. So the fabric we have set up 
is actually just serving IP connectivity. And you're allowed to do anything, whatever you want. If it's IP reachable, it's not limited. No access list, no additional security, it's all up to the firewall. In the policy module of uh, DNA Center, we utilize Cisco Trust Stack, and we have also a policy matrix inside Identity Services Engine, and what we did is we mirror the view from Identity Services Engine into DNA Center. And this is what we see here on the screen. So we get the matrix, you see all the groups. So the question is, where do the groups come from? And actually, I have connected my Identity Services Engine to the Active Directory in the lab, and these are the groups we have learned from Active Directory, which is, for instance, it's a user group of, uh, uh, of employees, of guests, of a company A, of partners. So some examples just to make it visible. And uh, these groups can have a relation. You need to bring the groups into a virtual network. So if I go to the virtual network tab, I have the, uh, the option to go into demo and just drag and drop groups into the virtual network. And from now on, the new group, the TrustSec servers, will be part of virtual network demo one. So if you authenticate in that group, you automatically get the correct VLAN provisioned onto your access port. And all you have to do is just using drag and drop? Drag and drop, that's all you need to do. Wow. So then the next thing is, let's go back to the metrics. Now you can start limiting the traffic. So if you want to apply a policy, and let's grab one of the policies here, you can just click on it, and we've prepared one, and the policy has a name, and has an access list in it, and the access list in this case is permit HTTP and HTTPS only, and do a deny any any at the end. So what's now available is that from BYOD to contractors, so these are the two groups, maybe I log in as BYOD user, you log in as contractor, if you're belonging to the same virtual network, we get an access list applied to our access switches. So when I want to contact you, I can do this used on the HTTPS basis, but I cannot ping you anymore and cannot FTP you anymore. I give you a simple use case. One of the use cases is, if you have a printer and an employee sitting in the same network, you want the employee to print in the network. But if you don't want the employee to manage the printer, <laughs> that means that we limit the traffic between. <laughs> Sorry, he has a fly on his head, so that, that is why we are laughing. I apologize for this, so it happens from time to time. <laughs> So that is about live, uh, live streaming in here. <laughs> so the employee cannot manage the printer, but they are capable of printing to the printer. But if I'm a desktop administrator and a printer administrator, I can print and I can do SSH and HTTPS management into the printer environment in that case. So I don't have to know anything about the actual SGTs and contracts and so on. All I have to know what kind of services I want to limit. Correct. So this, this list, you tell them HTTP from A to B and the rest is under the covers. And just to give you a last example, if you go into the work center of ICE, you don't have to get there, it's, fully complete, it's completely automated from here. You go into the Trustec environment, um, you go into Trustec components, and there you have the security group access list metrics. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty much the, t much the same as in DNA Center, and uh, you find the contract of HTTPS. So if I pull the contract, you recognize that this contract is now being translated into real CLI. So this is the HCL we are going to push into the network. Oh, so you've done everything through DNA Center. So even if there was some kind of configuration in ICE, if there was some configuration in the IPAM system, correct. I still had my single point of view. I didn't need any CLI to get the switches up and running. That is correct. And there was the assurance part to, and any troubleshooting steps necessary to step into. That is correct, this is absolutely correct. So before I sum up, ICE is completely hidden be behind the network and uh, we're behind the DNA center so that we do all the work, all the, the CLI work you formerly did, it's completely automated between ICE and DNA center. So let's do a quick summary what we have done in the last couple of minutes. We have talked about software-defined access, which is an up-to-date solution between DNA Center um, and the network environment. We integrated this into Identity Services Engine for policy, and we do, did a full automation to bring up a client and a network device zero touch. That means the network switch boots up into the DNA Center, it will get a full configuration, we assign a policy to the access port like 802.1x. Marcel can log into the network, gets IP connectivity, and by the end of the day, once he has connectivity, I give him a policy so that he cannot connect to the printer anymore. 
For that I want to close now, and I want to thank you for participating in my session, and I hope it was very valuable for you, and you get some learnings out of this, and I encourage you to try this out in our lab and play around with this to get the new, new stuff learned. Yeah, thank you, Marcus, and thank you, everybody else. So, again, it was really amazing to see how easy it is to set up uh, this fabric with uh, DNA Center without using any CLI and to get the integration with ICE and all the other products. So, I'm looking forward for everybody to try it out, and thanks a lot. Thank you.